Okay, so it's been a while since I've made a video, and I uh, thought I'd be doing a little more of it, but the webcam thing didn't work out. So, also I always kind of thought that the blogging, vlogging, would be kind of fun, and it is, but I don't think that's my forte. I think, um, I think I could do that more, but it's not something I want to do on a regular basis necessarily. I'm just going to leave that alone, and I want to delve right into more pottery stuff. I wanted to also cover a basic video similar to what I did in clay, but talk about glazes. So I have some notes here that I'm looking down at. So yeah, what I want to cover is mixing your own glazes. Now you can always, like clay, you can go out and buy glazes uh, pre-made or dry pre-formulated and you just mix them up to the specific gravity you want. And of course I'm only going to cover high fire glazes. This is cone 10. Because that's what I know, that's what I do. Um, and I gotta pick one. And so I'm not gonna pick one that I'm least comfortable with, you know? Yeah, what is a glaze? Some people don't know. Some people call them paint. <laughs> glaze is basically glass. It's just like, yeah, I'm in my glaze room right now, so I mean, here's a Pyrex thing. This is glass. If this was fused onto the clay, it could be called a glaze. I could crush that up and melt it, and it might be a glaze. Uh, it probably wouldn't work. But basically, you combine silica, alumina, and the fluxes to melt the silica and the alumina, I guess. But basically, silica doesn't melt that low. Silica melts at like 3,000 degrees. So you can't just use silica to make a glass. You have to bring something in to pull it down, to pull the melting point down, and that's called a flux. And you can use something like, you know, lead is a really powerful flux. It'll bring that temperature way, way down. And I'm not entirely sure, but to low fire range. Uh, so I think of kind of a glaze as, it's not really a good analogy, but like a candy apple. You know, you dip it in and it hardens or whatever, and it's a surface coating that melts. Uh, your clay is similar to a glaze in some respects, it's just really refractory and hasn't melted into a puddle yet. But if you go high enough, your clay will become a glaze, it will melt. So it's interesting because the glaze melts over the clay surface and where the clay and glaze meet, there's this little sort of zone there where the glaze and the fluxes are reacting with the clay and they sort of melt together. And it's almost like an epoxy or a glue or something that dissolves a little bit into the clay. So there's, there, it's a permanent bond. It's not something you could just chip off and reveal the clay underneath. Uh, a, you can, but then often the clay comes with the glaze because it's a, it's a s sort of a seamless transition. It's real small microscopic stuff, but uh, the glaze I guess my point is is the glaze reacts and depends on the clay body. It, they, they have a, a very, you know, tight relationship. So I guess what I, what do you need to know? What do you need to know if you're going to mix your own glazes? First, you need to figure out your firing temperature, which I covered. This is going to be high fire. Uh, that's important because you don't want your glaze to run all over everywhere. You know, you need to know kind of where you're going. Um, also, some ingredients don't work, work so well at higher temperatures. They burn out or they cause other problems. Uh, you need to know if it's food safe. That's pretty key. If you're going to be making dishes for somebody, you don't want to use lead or other, you know, you can't, you, you can use lead, but you have to be careful with it. But you don't want to use, you don't want to have a leaching glaze. You don't want to have a glaze that can potentially harm somebody. And you also want to worry about durability. Will it scratch with a fork? You know, that kind of thing. Is it rough and hard to clean? You know, whatever. Um, so you need to know if it's functional or purely decorative. And there is some liability involved, so you do have to make sure that you're, what it's leaching, even if it's not regulated by the government right now, because I think the government only regulates lead and cadmium. Uh, I could be wrong, but that's what I think. But there are other things in a glaze that could be potentially harmful. Um, so you have to be careful of that, because it could come back later if it's been proven that those thing hurt, things hurt people. You, even though it's not regulated, you could still be held liable. So it's, you got to be kind of careful. Now, luckily, it's not too hard um, to get a glaze that is reasonably safe. So you need to know those. Then you need to have a, a recipe. You need to have some sort of formula uh, to at least start from, or some approach. Uh, glazing is very scientific. You have to have a very clear method. It's, you, of course, you don't have to, but you'll get the best results if you're kind of anal attentive about it. If you keep very careful records. If you're, if you, you know, do things systematically. You know, a very fun way to do it is is empirical, which is observation, experimentation. 
Um, and you can take a base recipe and you can remove a key element, remove all the silica from it and see what it does, you know. And you can learn then what the silica does to the glaze. It's kind of like cooking. If you start with water, then you add, say, sugar. I mean, what does water and sugar do when you cook it? What does water and sugar and, you know, I don't know, garlic do when you cook it? And then you can keep adding things to that and eventually you might come up with some sort of sauce or something. Uh, that's kind of, you can do that with a glaze and you can learn what the materials do. And then when you go to another glaze formula or you want to do something, change a, a characteristic, you can say, well, you know, I remember in this last test I did, when I added alumina and I kept adding clay and clay, it got drier. Ooh, I'm out of focus. It got drier and drier and drier and melted less and less. So this one's really runny. So, gee, maybe I can add clay to this one and it'll solve the runny problem. That's the kind of thing when I mean empirical. And that's what I advocate and that's what I do. And I think that makes you a little better able to uh, understand what, what it is you're working with. Um, then there's the calculation form, which is basically you take, you use math. You look at all the, min the minerals, and they have formula, and they have moles. It's just like chemistry. You know, you have so many moles of every element, and then you can mathematically look at the ratios between silica, alumina, and glass, and all that, and you have the thermal, cal thermal expansion estimated calculations and all this, and you can get a pretty good, they have software for this, you can get a pretty good um, understanding of the glaze without ever doing a firing. It's a good tool, I think, for fixing problems. I don't, I haven't had as good a luck from scratch development from that method, because um, there's just too many unknowns. There's too many factors that a computer program can't keep you know, take into account. You know, particle size is a big one. You know, specific gravity, uh, the atmosphere, everything. There's so many variables, and then the materials, them, materials themselves are inconsistent. You might have a chemical formula for one test batch that you got off the internet. And it's fairly updated, but you don't know if yours are going to be identical. So there's, it's a really rough guide, but it's really very useful. And I use calculation for fixing a problem, which I can get into some problems. So I would recommend the empirical formula. So where to start? If you've never mixed a glaze before, I would, I would find, I would start with a glaze recipe that's been done by somebody else. And you can get glaze recipes there everywhere. Um, get them in books, magazines. One of the books I recommend, I don't think I have it here. I think it's called High High Fire Glazes. Oh, I can't remember. Clay and Glazes for the Potter. It's a book I recommended in my clay series, What Every Potter Should Know. Those are both excellent books for getting basic glaze recipes. You want to start with a clear. You don't want to go for ultra fancy. You just want to get something to melt and learn from. Um, so that's how I'd recommend starting. You get a recipe mix it up, fire it, and test it. Since you're going to be firing, you might as well do some testing. So in addition to finding a couple recipes, you can test as many as you want. You know, when I first started, I tested 20, 30 in a kiln firing or more uh, with alterations down. And I had, and, you know, every alteration, I take careful notes, you know, and then record them. You label your tiles. Basically, the way you test a glaze is you have a, a clay piece, and you can just be something you, you roll a coil and squish it down. Some, the autofocus is going haywire. Okay. It's a clay piece. Let me see if I have some of those. I think I have something like something like this. I don't know if you can see that. It's just a. I just smushed it. One side. Wow, that light is bright. Okay, one side's kind of clear, or not clear. One side's smooth, right? And one side's rough. So I can see what the glaze might do with different textures. Uh, I paint a white slip down one side, which you need a recipe for also, but basically you could do this with white clay, or you don't have to do this. It just shows you what it might look like on porcelain or a lighter body clay. Um, I have a hole here in it. That way I can hang it from a string. That's personally how I store them. And then on the bottom, you write with a little, they have special pins that are like little glazed pencils, uh, or you can brush iron oxide, or you can stamp or carve when this is green, a number. So then on my notes, I'll, I'll do, I'll say glaze number one, you know, and my, it's my base recipe, and I'll dip this in it and fire it, and then later I can match it up and I can see what happened. And maybe glaze number, you know, 10 is that base recipe, but I've taken out something in increments, and I keep careful notes, and then I can say, well, this glaze tile is beautiful. What's the, what, what is it? This is number 10. I look at my notes and say, oh, I've reduced the silica, you know, I'm looking at myself here, it's weird. I've reduced the silica down to... Whatever you know, that's how you that's how you can re, that's how you can duplicate your results. You have to keep careful notes, keep 
marking these very carefully. Um, and that's how you do it. So yes, you test your base recipe, but you should also do several recipes, and I think you should do some line blends. Basically, line blends are where you take two or three ingredients, I'd start with two, and just see how they act. So you should do something like calcium and custard feldspar. Those are very fundamental base ingredients. And so you mix them up in proportions. Uh, I guess I should take a step back. There's several ways of mixing a glaze, but the way I do it, I think the way it's done typically is by weight, dry weight, so you in grams. So if the recipe calls for 10% silica, it's just like clay, 10% silica, you weigh out your 10%, 10 grams of flint to make a 100 gram batch. A 100 gram batch is pretty good for testing. It's enough to get a test tile and enough to keep it fairly consistent. So 10% would be 10 grams. So you start with 100 grams of custard feldspar. That's batch one. You know, and then 90 grams custard feldspar, 10 grams calcium or calcium carbonate or whiting. Those are whiting is what it's called. It's calcium carbonate. Uh, that's a very common flux. So that's a 90-10 mix. And you go down the line and you end up at the end being 100% calcium. You can also mix up like 500 milliliters of 100% of one and 100% of another and mix them together wet to get your formula uh, mixes that way. I find that a little less precise, but it's probably precise enough and it's easier. Whatever your system, keep careful notes, keep it consistent. And I think you should do a few of those line blends in your testing. It helps you become familiar with the process. Basic materials in a glaze. I mentioned silica. Silica is known as the glass former. That's what makes glass. So you need a lot of, a pretty high percentage of silica. And you get silica in this kind of application in ceramics and pottery. You get it in ground up flint. Um, it also is found in other things, like it's found in clay. It's found in feldspar. Silica is a, most of the things you work with are compounds. They're mineral compounds. And so, like a rock out in your backyard, you break that rock up, there's gonna be all kinds of stuff in there. There's gonna be silica, there's gonna be other, you know, maybe potassium, calcium, there's gonna be a whole bunch of various minerals within the mineral. It's very seldom is it ever pure. So it's the same thing, you might be using ground up flint Flint is mostly silica, but there might be a few impurities, but for all practical purposes, it's pure silica. Um, silica is a glass former. You need alumina. Alumina, well, I guess I'll cover that. In, I'll cover fluxes first. So silica, the glass former, the flux to melt the glass. Um, these are, there's a lot of fluxes. A lot of different minerals can do this. Uh, common ones that you'll encounter a lot are, are Feldspar, like custard feldspar, uh, that's not really, I guess, a flux. It's a kind of a, it has everything in it. Uh, the potassium in the feldspar. So it's like potassium, calcium, uh, magnesium, lead, boron, lithium. There's lots of various fluxes. Feldspars are sort of a glaze in their own right. You can ground up a piece of granite or custard feldspar by itself does melt into a glaze. Nepheline cyanide is a sodium. That's another one. That's what I was trying to think of. Sodium feldspar. Nepheline cyanite is fun to say, but it's basically just a granite uh, type rock. It melts into a kind of a stiff glaze just by itself. Alumina. Alumina is a stabilizer. It, it's a, they call it a sticker. Um, it makes the clay stiff, it, or the glaze stiff. It doesn't allow it to run as easily. It also makes it a little harder and more durable. Uh, but it's a really important thing to have alumina in a glaze. Now, luckily, again, most things have it. So a lot of times the alumina factor isn't such a big deal, but you can add a little bit of clay. That's typically what you'd use to, to add to your alumina. Um, it can also kind of, everything just like in a clay body has give and takes. And so if you're trying to achieve a certain color or a certain effect, less silica, more silica, alumina might counter things. You know, um, different fluxes behave very, very differently. So you need, that's where the expertise and the years of experience come in. That will give you basically a clear glaze depending on your material, those basic things. Then you're going to want to add something else usually. Uh, often you use other fluxes because of their thermal um, expansion properties and other properties, uh, which you have to pay attention to. I'll get into that. 
and then basically you mix it all up with water. Oh, and your coloring oxides. If you want a, a brown glaze, you might add rust iron oxide. Uh, those are usually added in addition to the base glaze. So you have a base glaze formula, and then you add your coloring oxides into that. So you can add from the same glaze, from the same single formula, you could have a white glaze, a brown glaze, a blue glaze. You know, you can have the same base and have a whole range of colors depending on the oxide you add to it afterward. You mix it with water, um, and you mix it usually with consistent specific gravity. I don't personally measure specific gravity. I just go by feel, you know, dip my finger in it and look at it. It's about the consistency of heavy cream. Uh, but, it, but it's really better to get the specific gravity. And now that I have a hydrometer, I didn't have one before. Now that I have a hydrometer, I'll probably be taking specific gravity readings on my glazes. Um, it just helps keep things consistent. Um, so for learning and for developing, start with something simple. Now this video has gone on way too long, so hopefully I can trim it down to something manageable. Until next time, bye.